Welcome to 10 Minute Records Views, episode 215. And this time I'm going to talk about Gordon Lightfoot's 1966 debut record on United Artists, Lightfoot. And this is a 1966 American mono pressing, which sounds pretty darn good. This is theoretically Gord's first record, although it's not, because of course he put out a live album with his duo, The Two Tones, in 1962. His greatest years, of course, were the 1970s when he had many hits, a lot of which had lyrics drawn very directly and intimately from his personal life, which was a bit rough and chaotic. He wasn't a great husband, he wasn't a great boyfriend, he had addictions, he had jealousies, he had a lot of city miles racked up in his chassis in those years. As one anonymous interviewee told the writer Robbie Foulkes recently, life is pretty popular now, but he's only popular now because he's managed to outlive his shitty reputation. However, this record is before all the fame, before all the hits, or most of the hits anyway. It is when he's still a very earnest member of the folk fraternity of the 1960s, albeit with a bit of a taste for hard living already. Gordon Leffitt was born in Aurelia, Ontario in 1938 to two parents who ran a dry cleaning business. His mom recognized that he had a lot of talent, so she steered him into a variety of different aspects of child performance, a lot of which early on was through the church. And he sang in the local United Church Choir. He was a boy soprano. He actually won choral competitions while a soprano. All the way through his childhood and teen years, he was constantly performing. He was on the radio, he was performing at school, in the local theater, operettas, all kinds of different stages. He learned how to play the piano, the guitar, the drums. He was also obviously quite a singer and he was in a barbershop quartet called the Collegiate Four when he was 16, which won a CBC TV talent competition called Pick the Stars. In addition to being a good-looking dude who could play the guitar and write songs, he was also a football star and a track and field star. He won a whole bunch of scholarships to Canadian universities, but he actually elects to go to California instead after high school. In 1958, he heads off to the Westlake College of Music in Hollywood, but after studying jazz there for a year or two, unlike a lot of Canadian performers, he doesn't stick around in L.A. He heads home, and he's back in Ontario by 1960. He spent some time with the Gino Silvi Singers, with an outfit called the Singin' Swingin' Eight, and he's also regularly appearing on television in the early 1960s in Canada on CBC TV's show Country Hoedown. He was working odd jobs, he was driving a truck, he was working as a bank teller, and he was also playing quite frequently on the Toronto folk music scene, which was quite well established in the early 60s. 1962 was a pretty big year for Lightfoot. He goes down to Nashville, makes a couple of singles including a song called Remember Me, I'm the One, which goes to number five in Canada. He also records with Terry Whelan, a friend of his from high school, and together they had formed this duo called The Two Tones, a live album, which is hard to buy unless you've got several hundred bucks for an original mono pressing, but you can buy that, I think, on MP3 or CD. He also meets a cute Swedish girl called Brita, who was living in his apartment building. And they hit it off, and they decide eventually to get married, and they go off to Stockholm in 1963 to do the deed. After they're married in early 1963, they spend some time in London, which for Canadians in those days was extremely cheap to do. Lightfoot is gigging in a coffee shop in London. There's a couple of BBC staffers who show up and hear him think this guy's pretty good. And they ask him if he'll come and perform on a BBC TV show called The 625 Show, which played at 6.25 p.m. He does this, that goes well, and that leads to him apparently either performing on or hosting, depends who you believe, uh, an eight-part country and western show called the Country and Western Show on BBC TV over the summer of 1963. Another version of that story has it that BBC TV higher-ups were aware of the work that Lightfoot had done on the Country Hoedown program on CBC a couple years before, which seems kind of unlikely to me, but either way, he gets all his TV exposure in Britain, and then he and Brita come back to Canada at the end of 1963. He's back in the Toronto folk scene by 1964. He's also discovered Bob Dylan at this point, so his songwriting is getting more mature and more sophisticated. Ian and Sylvia Tyson stop in one night, hear him, they're impressed, and they record two of his songs, Early Morning Rain and For Loving Me, on their next album, which they actually title Early Morning Rain. And so Lightfoot is now on his way as a songwriter, which is really what he would be known for through the first several years of his career. Having done him one solid, they also did him another by introducing him to Albert Grossman, who was their manager, but also Bob Dylan's manager. He signs up Lightfoot, and it doesn't take him too long before he gets Lightfoot a record deal with United Artists. And so in December 1964, Lightfoot goes into the studios in New York to make this record. 
This record is made around Christmas time, 1964, at United Artists Studios in New York. The producer is a guy called John Court, who was Albert Grossman's business partner, and thus also the co-owner of the business which had signed Lightfoot. At this stage, Court was just starting out on what would be a fairly extensive career producing folk and blues records. Gord is on piano, guitar, and vocals. He's backed up on guitar by a guy called David Ray, who was an American guy who was becoming increasingly well-known in the folk scene in the mid-1960s. He had actually met Gord before up in Toronto at the Riverboat Nightclub, and he also was quite friendly with Ian and Sylvia, and he would end up recording with all of them. On two tracks, Long River and Peaceful Waters, the second guitar is actually played by a guy called Bruce Langhorn, who was a Greenwich Village regular. He was a guitarist and a percussionist. He was a regular guitarist for Bob Dylan in the studio. So if you know the song Subterranean Homesick Blues, that's his lead guitar there. And apparently, because he also played the tambourine, he was a real life inspiration for Dylan's Mr. Tambourine Man. Finally, the bass is played by a guy called Bill Lee, who's actually Spike Lee's dad of all things. He was a brilliant session player all the way through the 1960s, he played in records by Simon and Garfunkel, John Lee Hooker, and Aretha Franklin. It takes more than a year for this record to actually be released. It comes out in January 1966. And in that year, 1965, a whole bunch of things happen for Lightfoot. He appears at the Newport Folk Festival, which provides him with a great deal of acclaim. This is the same one where Dylan goes electric. He also plays The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and a bunch of his songs are recorded by other artists, and so he's really getting a bit of a rap, although he still hasn't got a record in the stores. That changes in 1966 when this record comes out, although really only generating modest sales. But as I said, his reputation was really that of a songwriter at this point, and that only continues. He continues to write very well-received songs. He's invited by the CBC to compose something for their forthcoming special for the centennial year called Canada 100 Years Young. And that turns into the Canadian Railroad Trilogy, which is, of course, a great song of chords. Around the same time, Peter, Paul, and Mary covered the same two songs that Ian and Sylvia had covered. And Marty Robbins takes Ribbon of Darkness off of this record to number one on the U.S. country charts. Eventually, for Gord, things would break big time in the 1970s. There are actually 14 songs on here, so I'm only going to touch on what I think are the highlights. For the most part, these are earnest folk songs, mostly originals. There are three covers on here, one by Phil Oakes, one by Hamilton Camp, and one by Ewan McCall. In those days, record companies, particularly if you're dealing with a brand new artist, as life it was, encouraged the inclusion of covers to increase the familiarity of the track listing to the standard record buyer. And this is actually followed here as a technique, but actually I would say that the originals are actually much stronger than the covers. Side one begins with Rich Man's Spiritual, which is folk in its sincerest 60s iteration, all about rich men, heaven, and the eye of a needle. His voice here, I think, is not necessarily as characterful as it would be in later years, although I don't think necessarily that detracts from the song. On this side, I very much love the way I feel. Gord is often given to professing confusion and dismay at the loss of love in his lyrics, although really, if you read about his life, it's kind of a two-way street Gord. Bill Lee is just superb here on bass, and getting back to Gord, this is a fantastic vocal performance. The two songs which have been hits for other people at this point are also on this side. For Love and Me, so much to love about this song. This great mixture of arrogance and self-deprecation, which is very characteristic of a lot of his lyrics plus a wicked hook and a great guitar lick that just stays in your head. And then, of course, Early Morning Rain. This, of course, is the first version he recorded. He redid it in 1975. You might prefer the 75 version, if only because of the depth of life from which he's singing at that point. Either way, it's a magnificent performance. It's one of the great Canadian songs, and one of the great songs about life on the road. On side two, I really like Steel Rail Blues, which apparently was inspired by a very long trip he took to Moosonee. It's one of those payoff songs with the punchline, as it were, coming in the very last verse. I think it's a contender for the very best vocal performance on the record, including some great falsetto work. I'm Not Sane is a reminder of all the different textures his voice is capable of. This is self-protective gourd, distant gourd, don't tie me down gourd, that great line, I may not be alone every time you see me. This is not heartbroken, vulnerable gourd. However, if you do like Gord's heartbroken songs, then Ribbon of Darkness is on this side, which of course is one of his classics. Sometimes a bit of a downer depending on my mood, but in general, you can't really argue with the performance. This is a really solid debut, full of heartbreak, loving and leaving, and railroads, basically the three things you want from a Lightfoot record. Some of these songs show that he's willing to experiment. The experiments don't always work, but usually they come off. And of course, he shows wonderful skills as a songwriter, closely approximated by the level of his singing, which I think is best when he sticks to his own compositions.
If you're going to buy Gord's records, you need this. It's a clear indication of his immense talent. For me, it's a great start for him. It's four to five stars.